Welcome to Talking Giants, presented by DraftKings. I'm your host, Bobby Skinner, here with my co-host, Justin Pennick. Speaking of DraftKings, we're, we're, we're recapping the entire New York Giants draft. We have mm. six new members of the New York Giants. Justin, how are you? Bobby Skinner, what a weekend. Um, what, a, what, a, what a weekend for us personally. Maybe we'll talk. We'll give a little thank you at the end of the show. But what a weekend for the New York football Giants. You know, we, we talked about all the trades that they made, um, and, and speci- especially trading back the main trade back and them getting an extra first round pick um, on Thursday, Friday morning. We talked about that. And uh, now they cap off their draft. And these six guys, we're going to be uh, rooting for them as long as they have an NY um, on, the, on their chest. And as long as they have an NY on the side of their head, we're going to root for them with all of our hearts. And we're so excited to break them down. You know, now, now is where the re- real work begins. We thought that we were done with all the work. No, now is when the real work begins, breaking all these guys down. How are you doing, Bobby Skinner? I am doing good. I mean, I have a lot of notes. I am ready to talk about all these players individually, yep. what they mean. And, and really, the trades are the story of this draft. But, but, but before we get into the draft, we're going to make a plea to you. Leave us a five-star rating review. We put in a lot of work to this, and it's fun. Like, I, I, I really have fun. Like, I'm, I'm sad that it, this, this, this part of the offseason is over. Leave us a five-star rating review. It's really it's the simplest way you can help us. We rarely ask. We ask you maybe like five, six times a year. You know, we're not an episode, you know, a show where it's like, hey, can you leave a five-star rating? rating review justin how are you doing leave us just a rating review it's the simplest you think you can do and even if, if you can't leave a review if you don't know how to like type or spell just go see let me dumb it down for you people who don't know how to spell words and you just know how to talk you, see, you go down to the bottom of the podcast and you see there's five little stars hit the hit the fifth one hit the fifth one so and then the people that can write write a review yeah and spell yeah so i mean it was kind of cool um after uh you know, Friday's show, I think we peaked as like the number 39 football show in the country. And we were like a top uh, 120 uh, uh, sports show in the country uh, for that Friday. So I thought that was pretty cool. So the more you can kind of leave ratings, the more people that we can leave ratings and the more we can get closer to a thousand then even above that, um, the more we can climb those charts. Uh, Bobby, we're on the billboard. uh, We're on the billboard hot 100. And speaking of, I mean, remember when I put this on the billboard and now you could see like little black smudges on it that is true. from us climbing up a ladder to a billboard to put that on there. So, all right, Justin, let's talk about this draft. So we're going to go through each of these players and talk about what, you know, their strengths, weaknesses, how they fit on this team, if they will even make this team. But I'll say this, the story of this draft is not the players. It's the trades. Dave Gettleman, Trader Dave, finally traded back. He finally traded back. And not once, but twice. Now we 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 went in depth um, on Kadarius Tony and the on the initial trade on the Kadarius Tony episode. So if you want to like get like real deal uh, deep on that, check out that episode. But we added through this draft a first round pick, a fourth round pick, and a fifth round pick from the Bears. That fifth round pick was used to trade up, and then also trading back from our from forty two to fifty, we got a third round pick from the Dolphins next year. Yep. We have ten picks. Next year for 2022, the Giants have 10 picks. And it's not just 10 picks. Last year, we had 10 picks. Four of them were seventh rounders. Yeah. Next season, we have a one, a one, a two, a three, a three, an extra four. We have – they. so let's see. We got one, no, I have one, it, I have two, it right here. I have it right three. here. How, how, how many picks do we have on the first two days? On the first two days, we have – um. One, two, five picks. three, five four, picks on the five. first two days. Yes, and two in the first, one in the second, two in the second. No, uh, two in so the third, excuse me. Seven of the ten are in the first four rounds, you know, where last season f- five of the ten were in the last two rounds. Now we got Tay Crowder and Carter Coffin out of it, but still, it's better to be higher up in the draft, clearly. Um, yeah, there's some there's some people that like to you know put together metrics that like to put together numbers that you know there's ways to measure the value of draft picks and you know not only are the Giants tied but the Philadelphia Eagles next year with having the most draft picks but they are I believe uh, they are above the Eagles in terms of the value like the value of picks that they have particularly you know Bobby we just talked about you know days one and two having all those draft picks on days one and two they have like the most value draft picks and this is as of right now. Um, you know, and it's even going to get even stronger when the Chicago Bears go 0-17 and we're going to have uh, we're going to have pick 32. Yeah, and it's, it's that important because first round, you need to be a starter. Now, Kadarius Tony, you have those like 
any the first round you need to be an impact player rookie year like you're going to be you're essentially going to be on the field you know obviously there's there's nuance to it round two you're probably going to be a starter so we have three like through next year's draft we'll have three impact players right away but then we also have two third round picks and third round picks can be starters day one but they're players that you expect to become competent like average to above average football players they don't always do it but like you expect that out of a third round pick like Aaron Robinson we expect that Rodarius Williams we don't really expect him to become that if he does awesome but we're not putting those expectations so I it's you know I'm very excited for the season but I'm really excited for next year's draft already you know like I, I kind of you know you know you know we're looking forward to the season but it's like next year's draft is going to be so much fun because of how many valuable picks we have yeah and who's to say <laughs> this is getting kind of crazy Who's to say that the Giants aren't in a three-team race in the NFC East with the Washington Football Club and the Dallas Cowboys, and at the trade deadline, we make a move? Who's to say we don't do that either? And that would be kind of cool. Maybe for, let's just say, interior offensive line is like a huge problem. We go out and we, we, get a, we give a third round and a fifth rounder for an interior offensive lineman. You know, Giants even have that flexibility to do that too. I didn't even think about that. That's yeah. That's a great point, man. So, um, it, it's just awesome. Trader Dave, good job on Dave Gettleman. Joe Judge, you know, obviously Joe Judge has influence. It's it really is collaborative. You know, some people say it's all Dave, some say it's all Judge, but I really do think it's all collaborative. Um, I mean, I'm I'm just in, I'm impressed with what the Giants did this season. Yeah, this and and kind of maybe kind of even moving away from the draft picks because that's exciting. But honestly, we won't. We won't fully know what those draft picks look like until, like I said, the Giants win the Super Bowl and then the Bears go 0-17. We won't exactly. know what, what those draft – we won't know what they will really look like. But just looking at the draft class overall, Bobby, I, we'll talk about it overall and then we'll go to the specific players. But you, you've had the take, and I, I want to let you explain this first because I, th- I, have a, I have, a I think, a solid rebuttal to you. You look at this year's draft class and – I don't want to take the words in your mouth, but I'm going to paraphrase. You're but, not as ex- you're not as excited when you look at this year's players compared to last year. And yeah. I have a rebuttal to you, but I want to hear more of what you have to say on that. Well, that's literally the next bullet point of my note is that that's, I don't, I don't, you know, so and, and, Andrew Thomas, you know, I, I, I am very much more excited about him than Kadarius Tony, you know, and I, Andrew Thomas, I do think is like, is just a better prospect. And obviously the need was there. Um, McKinney. I'm a little more excited for him than Oziz Ojolari. Although Ojolari is such at a position of need that I, I'm I'm kind of back and forth on that one. Um, Aaron Robinson, I'm excited for him, but it's like we got Holmes, Ellerson Smith. We'll talk about he's a you know he's he's a project. So last year's draft, and and I think it was more a credence to last year's draft. I think last year's draft was awesome. Andrew Thomas, you got your left tackle starter. Xavier McKinney, we haven't seen much from him, but what we have seen has been good. We haven't you know. In his limited time, we've not haven't seen anything bad. Matt Parrott, who's going to start this year, you know, he's a, he's a guy with like your uh, with a lot of of good traits. Darnay Holmes, really good p- player, year one in the fourth round. Shane Lemieux, I know we kind of talk about Shane Lemieux and the struggle on the interior offensive line. I love Shane Lemieux as a fifth round pick, I really do. And then you add Tay Crowder and Carter Coffin into there. Like Tay Crowder's our starter. Carter Coffin's someone who with real pass rush moves. He doesn't have the highest ceiling, but he has real pass rush moves. So. Like, I think it's more, I just love last year's uh, crop of players more so than I do this year's. Yeah. And I guess when you look at players, um, you know, I, I, Bobby's the type of guy where, you know, he, he is more of a film guy. So evaluating players is something that he likes to do. Whereas I am a guy that I like to look at big picture things and big picture themes, big picture stats, where, how can the giants improve as a team? And frankly, my rebuttal to Bob, you know, Bobby not being as, as excited with this year's draft class, I'm just and I, I'm not saying that you're not, I'm just more excited about this Giants team this year, which I know you are as well. Uh, I'm not, uh, I'm not saying a lot that less not. holes to fill this year with. Right. You know. And that, so this is, so this is my rebuttal where the Giants, what they did with this year's draft class is they filled areas. And I'm not, and when I say areas, I don't mean positions, certain areas at which they lacked in 2020, they acknowledged those areas at which they needed to get better. So most notably, because they only had two offensive draft picks, but also they were very offensive heavy in free agency. 
Um, and, I, and when you take an offensive player in the first round, that first round value, it, there's a lot more value in the first round compared to the rest of the draft anyway. So I'm not complaining about only taking two offensive players, because especially when they went so heavy in free agency too. But defense, let's talk about the areas. And when we talk, I think we talked about this way before the draft too, but if you're listening to the first time, this is the first time you're hearing it. The areas in which the Giants in 2020 were lacking on the defensive side of the ball is that they played kind of passive with 37% cover three. So they kept everything in front of them. They were a bend, but don't break defense. And they averaged three minutes per drive on the field. That was the third most in the national football league. So they had a hard time getting off the field. Now, even though they were 10th in pressure rate, that's pretty good. They hit the quarterback. They got pressure on the quarterback at a top 10 rate. Patrick Graham was 19th in blitz rate. That's kind of the opposite of what he did in 2019 with Miami. He was very high blitz rate, and he did a lot of man coverage, press man coverage, like being especially aggressive, on third down too. and especially on third down. That's not what Patrick Graham was in 2020, and that's why we love Patrick Graham, because he's able to be versatile, and he's able to adjust. But one of the things that we were, that we were expecting in this year's draft class is the Giants may acknowledge and may pick players who fit more of that aggressive playing style, especially in the secondary, um, which they did. Aaron Robinson and even Williams, Rodarius Williams, is, is like a press man corner, even though we don't really expect him to do really anything year one. And acknowledging the edge rusher position and not just getting edge rushers that can – that are kind of just boring. I don't want to say boring, boring, versatile players. That pass including, rushers. Pass they, rushers. Got pass, they got pass rushers. So – there, so that's why I get very excited with this year's draft class. You know, I, and it, maybe it's kind of even for me. There's also I, I, it hindsight's a, th- a thing that's in my brain, and I don't know if I can ignore that when evaluate when comparing this year to 2020. But what I love about what they did, especially on the defensive side of the ball, is the Giants acknowledged the areas, the areas in which they struggled with, and it matches the players that they brought in. Yeah, yeah. Like I mean, we knew Patrick Graham wanted to play more press man covers. We thought Adore Jackson might be enough with that, um, but you know they are severely lacking at edge. You know their their two best players to that spot are both coming back from injuries with Renzo Card and Oshane Zimenez. Um, where we'll talk about with Aziz, I, I think he's the best player at that spot right away. Maybe if Carter was fully healthy, that'd be debatable. But but I do think Aziz walks in and is the is going to have the best production at that spot. All right, just but here's what they didn't do: is they didn't get offensive line. Mm-hmm. They didn't they didn't address offensive line and and. I do understand some frustration with that because part of it is Justin, I wanted them to draft Ray Sean Slater at 11. Now they traded back. So I, I liked, I liked, I love trading back. But if they were to stay at 11, I wanted it to be Ray Sean Slater. And not just because Devontae Smith was off the board. If Devontae Smith or Jalen Water were both there, I would have taken Ray Sean Slater. The only receiver I would have taken over Slater would have been Jamar Chase. Um, and then I would have taken Penny Sewell over him. So, like, because the offensive line is a huge question mark. You, we feel good about Andrew Thomas and Nick Gates. Will Hernandez, we don't feel like he's going to make a jump and be really good, but I, I'm fine with Will Hernandez starting. So you have really two big question marks in Shane Lemieux and, and Matt Parrott. And it, it's it's a risk that they are taking. Um, but here's here's why I if they didn't go round one, they got Kadarius Tony. They're trying to add playmakers, and we'll talk about him, how he impacts the offense in a second. But here's why. If you're not going to go in the first round, I have no problem with them not addressing it later in the draft because they already did that. That's what Matt Parrott and Shane Lemieux are. They are the later in the draft addressing it later type players. And it's like, well, they could use depth. Well, we, they have depth, Justin. Jonathan Harrison, 42 career starts. Zach Fulton, 90 career starts. Nate Solder, 127 starts. They have 259 starts between three their three main backup offensive linemen. Yeah, That's and they a- also um they also kept Kyle. No, he's not. He doesn't have any experience on draft a free agent last year. But they kept Kyle Murphy around for a reason too. They signed him to the roster midseason, and he was one of the like he was an undrafted free agent. Where like he could he could turn into something. And I don't want to put any expectations on him. But the argument to the what I just said with the backups is like, well, they're not good. Well, it's like yeah, they're backups. But we have we have competent backups you know they're not going to come in and be good off like really good offensive alignment but we have competent backups so i have no problem that if like when they just went best player available in the in on day two and day three and you know what edge was a huge need they did that on on day two so round three the seven they essentially just went their best player on their board don't we all preach best player available how come that only comes to round one you yeah. know what i'm saying like that is 
we I was asking for offensive line all draft season once we signed Kenny Galladay, and I was everyone was shouting down at me. Oh, best player available. You can't take Elijah Vera Tucker at 11. Uh, best player available. It's like, well, all right. Because, you know, the whole you can get those guys in the mid rounds does not always work out like that. Um, so the fact that they didn't do in the first round, I'm fine with them not doing it in the later rounds. Now, it's, it is a risk that they didn't do it in the first round. But not taking, a, uh, you know, someone in, in the fifth, you know, the sixth round doesn't make a difference. And I think a lot of people, like, if they would have taken – Brett Heggie, the undrafted free agent center we signed from the Gators in the sixth round, people would just be like, okay, we got offensive line. Yep. But it's like we got – like it, it was it's, – it's, it's not about positions. Then that's my point of that. It's about players. They went out and got players. They got the guys who were best player available on their board with Ellerson Smith, with Rodarius Williams, um, with Brightwell, the running back, um, even though we'll talk about him. In my opinion, he probably wasn't the best player of people. So I am totally fine with that. And it's like, well, the Trey Smith fell. Well, it's like nobody, t- no team knew the Trey Smith better than the New York Giants. We have his head coach in Jeremy Pruitt. <laughs> nobody knew him better. And clearly there was a huge issue. He fell to the seventh round. Yep. Like he, he, he fell to the seventh round. Clearly there was a huge issue yeah, with it, Trey Smith for him to fall to the seventh round. Somebody made the point in our live stream, you know, it's not just the Giants that were passing on interior offensive linemen. It was the rest of the NFL that passed on Wyatt Davis for a hot sec. It was the rest of the NFL that passed on Deontay Brown. It was the rest of the NFL that passed on Trey Smith. And, you know, the, tr- Trey Smith, I feel like, is that one player that if you want to be, you know, a little upset that, come on, like this this dude is is kind of good. And, you know, he didn't, he didn't miss a lot of time necessarily, playing time, you know, in terms of the stuff that we can see. So if you want to be, like, upset with that, fine, you know, and and not taking him in like the sixth round with that final pick. If you want to be upset, like go for it. But it is kind of crazy that, you know, they, we do have his, like his head coach in the building and they still passed on him. So I, that should be telling that should be telling. Yeah. So can I, can I want to review something with the offensive lineman? Because frankly, you know, a point that I was making on the live stream is think of the resources that are already like just divvied out on this offensive line. You have the fourth overall pick of the 2020 draft and Andrew Thomas. And frankly, I don't even think it matters what we do at guard, Bobby. If Andrew Thomas is a below average tackle for the majority of the season, like he was in 2020, then we're screwed. People, but he won't be. He, he, no, he would no day after the draft. He won't be, but you know, in terms of people that are, that are panicking over the offensive line. And I think that it's fine. He here's the, you know, he, here's like my, you know, my thoughts, Andrew Thomas needs to be good. And I think if Andrew Thomas is good, if we have a, a, a an above average left tackle um, this, this season, I think that will make the entire unit look pretty darn good. Cause especially, you know, we saw how deflating it can be when your left tackle is bad, especially when you have Eric flowers and Nate Solder as your left tackles for the last couple of years. Um, we know how deflating it can be. It can be deflating for an entire offense. I think Pat Shermer, large reason why Pat Shermer lost his job because Nate Solder was a, was a, was the worst left tackle in the national football league. And, and he costs his football games. Okay. Left guard. Will Hernandez high second round pick high second round pick ton of value that's put in there. Nick Gates. Hey, we hit on an undrafted free agent. That happens. Good for the Giants. Homegrown talent, and we extended him. Great. Value. Right guard. Shane Lemieux. Fifth round. Okay, you know, maybe we want to upgrade that, but Matt Parrott, third round pick. So we have three of our five starters on the offensive line who are high leverage draft picks. Now, if you really, if we really want to build it like the Dallas Cowboys did in 2016, you know, that's the comparison, right? Uh, Tyrone Smith, first round pick, ninth pick in the NFL draft in 2011. Travis Frederick, first round, 31st pick. Zach Martin, first round, 16th pick. So I guess it's not unheard of to just have (laughs) like three first round. You know, Will Hernandez is basically a first rounder, right? Just a few picks after the first. He's basically a first rounder. I guess it's not unheard of to have three first rounders on your offensive line. But still, that's kind of like bananas. And Leo Leo Collins was a first rounder who went undrafted free agent because like he witnessed a murder. Yeah, and Doug, and Doug Free, Doug Free was a, and I'm just, I'm just looking at 2016. Doug Free was a fourth round pick, so even that's like a hot mid mid value pick. Yeah, so, um, yeah, they, hey, they're putting a lot of uh, trust in it. You know, if it doesn't work out on the offensive line, it's going to hold them back. Um, you know, Dave Gettleman would probably lose his job because yep. of it. Uh, 
So we'll, we'll see it. You know, I agree. It is risky. You know, that's why I really want to, you know, an office alignment in, in, in round one, it, it's, right. it's a hundred percent risky. Um, I was really praying AVT would have fell to 20, but mm-hmm. good job on the jets, by the way, I think they'd knock the draft out of the park yep. this year, but just try, I mean, we have no, this is, this is where the whole, I usually hate saying wait and see, but, and, and just trust the process. Right. But this is where you have to just trust Rob sale. Pat Flaherty are going to, you know, Pat Flaherty was coaching uh, Rich Soiber, who was, who was an undrafted free agent, David Deal, who was a fifth round pick, Kareem McKenzie, who was a very talented free agent acquisition, Sean O'Hara was a free agent acquisition, Chris Snee, who was a high value pick, you know, in the NFL draft too. So trust that Flaherty and Sale are going to coach these guys up and, you know, they're, they're going to get there. And also, we have trust a good run that- blocking O line. Yeah. Yeah. That is true. That is true, by the way. And trust that in terms of our pass blocking, that <laughs> they, they took their notes from last year saying, if we want defenses to not blitz us at such a high rate, we need to expand the field a little bit more and make th- th- make things easier on the offensive line because yeah. the passing game and the play calling made things extremely hard on a not talented offensive line. That's a great point with the run blocking too. Andrew Thomas is a mauler in the run game. Will Hernandez, I think we feel better as a run blocker than a pass blocker. Nick Gates is nasty. Feel like he's a good versatile player. Shane Lemieux is definitely a better run blocker than a pass blocker. And we Matt improved Parrott, as a run block as a run blocking for last year. Yeah, and Matt Matt Parrott's a better run blocker than Cam Fleming. Correct. Will so, Hernandez, he's a better run blocker than Kevin Zeitler. Now Kevin Zeitler was an overall better player than Will Hernandez, but run blocking wise. Hernandez moves guys off the line of scrimmage where Zeitler was just kind of a do his job type on, on the run game. And then in the pass game, that's where he made his money. So we'll see, you know, I mean, everyone knows I was pounding the table for that offensive line in round one and to, you know, don't, you know, don't go for the flash receiver. They traded back on extra first round pick, which I love. Um, and then they get a receiver that they like a lot. And let's talk about the receiver Kadarius Tony. Now we're not going to break him down fully as a player. If you want that, check out the, the most recent episode, but I mean, Quickly, he is the human joystick. He is really fun to watch. He probably has the best highlight tape out of anybody in the draft. Like, like, I mean, it's just watching his stuff. And when you watch from the all 22, man, some, sometimes it's just like, how the hell did one, did he break all these tackles? But then he scores on this play. Like, it's just, he really is so much fun to watch. Like, I'm probably going to post, high, you know, his touchdowns all week long. I'm like, look at this crazy ass touchdown by Kadarius Tony. Um, but, the main thing with Kadarius Tony is I really do think this signals a change for this offense, that they're going to do things differently, that they're not just going to line up and we're going to run a stick with the tight end, uh, one go ball, a curl, and a flat route. I, I really don't think it's going to be that bland vanilla offense where we say our players have to be better than yours. And that's what we kind of – we expected it to be better this up se- upcoming season, but we didn't expect some, like, wholesale changes to the way they ran their offense. We thought, hey, Kenny Galladay – fits well in what Jason Garrett's tra- traditionally done. Kyle Rudolph fits well into what he's traditionally done. Sterling Shepard kind of fits that slot, and Darius Slayton is that outside wide receiver. You know, we didn't think they were going to do anything crazy with those people to kind of line up and let's see what we can do. Off, hope the offensive line gets better. Kadarius Tony cannot be just a lineup and play to play, especially not year one. They have to use him differently. They have to use him a ton in motion. Uh, at the snap motion, the Giants were 22nd in the NFL. At, at at 8%. The highest in the league was 35% in 2020. Pre-snap motion, they were 26 in the league. They had 36%. The highest was 70%. So teams doubling at that. So Kadarius Tony needs to be used uniquely. Put him in motion. Stack him up behind a wide receiver. That's something s- subtle that the Giants really didn't do. Space guys out. Put him in the backfield. Let him and Saquon. Have some fun with him and Saquon. Um, I really do think this signals a change for the Giants offense. And I think, you know, they kept Jason Garrett, but Joe Judge has added some younger, more innovative minds. Joe Judge himself is a younger, you know, innovative mind are changing what this offense is about to make it easier for everyone involved. Make this easier for everyone involved. And and Kenny Gold is a huge piece of that. Um, You know, like you said with the offensive line, please blitz us now. Because now we got Kenny Galladay on one side. We got Kadarius uh, Tony in the slot. And hell, you know what? Darius Slayton might beat your cornerback too for a 35-yard, 40-yard contested to a catch touchdown. So if used correctly, even with an offensive line that might struggle a little bit, this offense could be really good. You know, the offensive line 
was in a worse spot in 2019, and they're the 19th ranked offense with the rookie QB who turned over the ball a ton. Okay, so it's it's not impossible to be successful. I think expecting them to be in that like 12 to 16 uh, range of offense is not unreasonable. And if it goes really well, maybe it could even if Kadarius Tony comes in and lights it up off the rip, and Jones and Gall they have that real connection, and Slayton takes a step forward, like. And the offensive line plays better than we we think it uh, think it will. Like, there's a lot of potential with this offense right now. I can't help but agree, and it just goes back to that point of if you're concerned about the offensive line, which I I I partially think you know, listening to the tone that Dave Gettleman had about the offensive line post day two and post day three, it was a little bit of a different story. Or post day three, we were saying we trust the guys we have in the room. Post day two there was, we're looking to add a little bit more talent. So I I even think, you know, if you're concerned about it as a fan, I even think the the Giants, even though I think they do believe in the guys that they have in the building, they are still a little concerned about it. This is the way, and we just broke it down for the last couple minutes, calling things, doing things different schematically on offense this year is the way that you can make things easier on the offensive line. And I think that has to be the main, the main priority while also, highlighting the strengths of Daniel Jones, which we did not do in 2020. And we did do that in 2019. Yeah. So again, we'll, if you want to see there, us talk for 30 minutes on Gadarius Tony, check out the last episode, but I'm excited for him, man. He's a very exciting player. Like I, I love that pick. Yep. It's a risky pick. Cause he's a, he is a different player and he needs to be used differently than you're, you know, like he needs to be used differently than Elijah Moore needs to be used on the jets. Where Elijah Moore, you play him, you line up in the slot, and you have him do slot things. Kadarius Tony, you got let's just be different. Let's be a team that uses the smart teams. You know, it's something that says it gets said about Kadarius Tony. Like, man, you put that guy on the Chiefs, and it looks awesome. Well, you know what? Why don't we try and do some things that the best offense in the NFL does? Now, yep. granted, we don't have Patrick Mahomes, but you know what? We can still do a lot of good things. That's right. So, Bobby Skinner, before we get into the rest of the draft class, the hits literally keep on coming from one boxing event to the next. They grow in excitement and anticipation, and this weekend is no different with two of the sport's most respected fighters stepping into the ring Saturday night. There is no better place to get in on all the action than with DraftKings Sportsbook, America's top-rated sportsbook app. For this weekend's fight, DraftKings is offering all new users a shot of turning $1 into $50. To celebrate this weekend's huge event, DraftKings Sportsbook is offering new users the opportunity to get 55 to 1 odds on either main event fighter to win this weekend's fight. That's bet $1. And if the fighter of your choice wins, you cash in $55. Oh, I'm sorry. I read that wrong the first time. It was $55, not $50. I don't have my glasses on, so I am an idiot. DraftKings Sportsbook is safe, reliable, and secure. Huh? Yeah, that's why. Yeah, that's why. Um, Safe, secure, and reliable, unlike me when reading ads, meaning you can deposit and withdraw your funds at your convenience. Download the top-rated DraftKings Sportsbook app now and use code JOHNBOY when you sign up for a limited time only. Only users can bet $1 to win $55 on this weekend's main event. That's right. DraftKings Sportsbook is going all out for new users by offering them the chance to win $55 when placing a bet on of $1 on this weekend's big fight, only at DraftKings Sportsbook. Must be 21 years or older. New Jersey, Indiana, Pennsylvania only. New customers only. Restrictions apply. See DraftKings.com slash Sportsbook for details. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or an Indiana 1-800-9 with ITA. All right, Justin, let's talk about the rest of this draft. And it starts with Aziz Ojolari, outside linebacker of Georgia. Six foot three, 240 pounds. SEC leader in sacks in 2020. In 10 games, he had nine and a half sacks, 12 and a half tackles for a loss. The year before that, um, where he wasn't playing, he was playing, but not playing like a ton. He had five and a half sacks, five and a half tackles for a loss. He is a really good athlete. And his best strength is bending that corner, dipping down low, and getting around the edge of offensive tackles, Justin, um, with good get off. And again, he bends that corner versus the offensive tackle. He gets offensive tackles, hips open which sets you up for all types of different things. Um, pass rush moves, right now they're limited. Um, but he does use that two-hand swipe. That's something you talked about a lot when we, we, we previewed him the edge episode. Yeah, and here's and here's what I had to say about his limited pass rushing moves, Bobby. Like, yes, they are limited, but the hand swipe move, it is pretty elite, and I think that's a pretty effective move. If you're going to be good at something, I think that's a pretty good move to be effective at. Burst and quickness can also help in that regard too, but also he varies the 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 pass rushing plan 
which he's not going with the same approach and the same speed. You know, maybe he's going to vary, you know, when he engages with you from one rep to the next. So between being fast off the edge and having burst and quickness, get having a little bit of bend, having that hand swipe move. And I also think having that varied plan of, have, have, of a pass rush, it can maybe offset not having a ton of moves, but he still need, he still does need to develop some moves though. Yeah. And there's something I learned about him that we'll talk about when I, when I finish this um, in the run game, he's good at disengaging run blocks. You know, he's not like, he's not going to like just totally just stonewall an offensive lineman one-on-one and win that, but he's good at disengaging that. And you see that with his speeds and his, his good hands. If he's get, if he put, if he gets pulled on, he will, he will, he, that's where he will stop you. Yeah. He'll put it, he'll dip down low and stop you in your tracks. Doesn't matter if you're Deontay Brown, the freaking mountain out of Alabama, he will stop you in your tracks. If you're pulling in on him, it's really good, but he can be moved off of his spot in the run game. Um, decent coverage ability. And I think that puts him in, in the scheme fit and, and you can see him getting better at it here. Here is my big downfall on Aziz Ojulari. And why, when he was talked about in the first round, he was someone else like, I I don't want that. Against some of the more athletic offensive tackles, he struggles because he relies on getting around that corner and bent and bending the edge. And the athletic uh, offensive tackles, you can't do that against when you don't have the strength. And Aziz Ojolari doesn't have the strength right now. So he needs to work on getting, you know, one, gaining some more lower body strength in those legs and really pitting that punching guys in the chest and being able to get them off balance. And that's where your speed, that's where his pass rush ability can make it to the next level. And maybe that's what people saw about out of him in the first round. Like they think he can add that, but right now it's a struggle. You know, he struggled, you know, when he was lined up versus Alex Leatherwood, he struggled stone Forsyth, who, you know, he was a day three pick by the Seahawks from the Gators. He struggled against him. So, there, you know, that is my that was my worry about Aziz when he was talked about in round one, but we got him at pick fifty, you know, and so now I'm, it went from a guy who you were scared of pre-draft to now I'm excited about him because we got him at pick fifty, and again I really do think he walks in and is the best edge rusher on this team. Yeah, no, I, absolutely. He may not see the most snaps. Now watch me be wrong. He may not see the most snaps. Well, who who would see more? I mean, I think Lorenzo Carter would. Um, he may he may see the second most snaps behind the the, the Lorenzo Carter. Now, I think if Lorenzo Carter is healthy, Lorenzo Carter is going to see like a lot more snaps compared to the rest of the edge rusher group. But I wouldn't be surprised if we ended the year and Aziz Ojolari is second on the team in the high in, in the the highest rate of snaps. And somebody is inevitably going to get hurt, so somebody is also going to have to inevitably just step up for a couple weeks or whether it be for an entire season. So, um. Something that I also I thought was pretty cool when he was picked, Andrew Tom, him and Andrew Thomas were hanging out. They're friends. Um, they were roommates. Yeah, and th- uh, him and Andrew Thomas were um, captains under the Cur- you know the Kirby Smart era, and I think Aziz was the first freshman captain. I have in my notes here. Really? Um, I yeah, I, I talked about it. Um, we love our Georgia Bulldogs. Yeah. I mean, we got I, Lorenzo. We got Tay Crowder. We could have DeAndre Baker if he you know. You know, okay, yeah, similar to Andrew Thompson, and obviously coming from the same school, really high character guy was the first freshman named a captain during the Kirby Smart era. So even a high character character guy too. And I and I'm pretty sure at this point, you know, all these SEC coaches they have relationships with each other, but the Giants should honestly have a pretty good relationship with Kirby Smart because we've picked like 17 guys from the school. Yeah, we 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 it's the Georgia Giants is, is what I say, and and I, you know what, I peaked at a way too early um, mock draft. And they had us taken uh, George Pickens, the wide receiver out of Alabama, or out of and Georgia. And I think the the second pick was a cornerback from or, the Gators, yeah. which would be interesting to see our first round picks face up against each other, Elam versus versus Pickens. So that would be interesting. Here's something I didn't know: he's only 20 years old. Yeah, he is young. Now we're going to talk about Rodarius, who's going to be 25 when this season starts. I didn't realize he was so young. So I think some of that strength is going to come there. You know, like we talk about, Eller, you know, with Ellerson Smith, like. He came in the college at 195 pounds. Like, I do think Aziz is going to add some some mass and some strength. And if, if, if he's a hard worker and really come in and build it, I, I'm excited about Aziz Ojolari at pick 50, man. Again, if they would have taken him, if they would have taken him at 20, 
like you know we were talking on the, you know during the live stream it's like i i like could he pay here it's like i don't want it to be aziz ojalar here i didn't view him as a first rounder but at pick 50 man this is this is awesome that some people did view as a first rounder yeah um, um a lot, some people talked about medicals you know well, he he tore his acl when, when he was in high school in high school and he hasn't like missed a game so. yeah he hasn't missed a game and J- dr james andrews like did a test on him who's like the best you know doctor especially when it comes to like acls and stuff yeah. and sent out her, and this was dan duggan found this out sent out a report to all the teams like he's fine it's fine i really do think that he didn't fall because of the knee now i'm sure it had a little bit but i really do think it was they saw like you know the stone forsyth and the alex leatherwood matchup and, and yeah. worried about that but again yeah. he had you know he led the sec in sacks though so as much as like i keep on like, like bringing that up like he led the best conference in football he led that conference in sacks. Right on. Excited. Good value. Um, do you think he's the best pass rusher right away on this team? Do you think like he's the best pass rusher on this team? You know, you want to say O'Shane, but you just, we just haven't seen it. We just haven't no, seen I anything. wouldn't say O'Shane. I would definitely – I would 100% say Aziz over O'Shane. I, th- I think it's between him and Lorenzo Carter, which I, yeah. I think it's Aziz. I think if you're just talking about pass rush ability – I really do think it's clearly a Z. Now I got a little excited talking about Ellerson Smith and, you know, and then I went and rewatched him and I was like, okay, as you know, I, I had this take of like, you know, you know, Ellerson has more raw pass rush ability than, no. Aziz. and I was like, no, that's not true. He can, but he doesn't right now. You know, mm-hmm. uh, I got a little overexcited um, talking about him because, you know, this is a 14 sacks, but I really do think Aziz Ojolari walks in and he's the best pass rusher on this team. Yeah. Um, I would love to see. So this is both with him and uh, him and Ellerson Smith. I, I want to see. I want to see these guys run some stunts because uh, it's going to be pretty exciting to have some good. I mean, these are awesome, awesome athletes. You know, yeah. if more, more than anything, you know, they're both young. They're both kind of you know raw. I feel like that term is overused, but they're they're both young and they're inexperienced. We can say. Um, I would like to see him just run some stunts and just like, hey, you know, let's let's get these executed. Let's get these down. You know, get skinny, bend, and go. Yeah, and that's the thing is Aziz, when he does different things, he makes an impact. Like, okay, like I've, I've, I've referenced the Alex Leatherwood game a million times, but Aziz made impact in that game. Like, he made plays in that game, whether it was in the run game. You know, he had a huge hit on Mac Jones. Like, he had impact yeah. in that game. It just wasn't through, like, that traditional, like, bend the edge that, yeah, that he, he, he changed. Does. He changed that Auburn game, by the way. I mean, I, I Auburn's offensive line is bad. But I mean, I I went through that. I watched the Alabama game and I watched the Auburn game when I did my preview of Aziz, uh, uh, you know, way back when. That was our first episode. That was our first draft preview episode we did. And I watched two games, and Aziz, there was a minute and a half worth. There was a minute and a half uh, worth of highlight clips <laughs> from one game. One game. Um, so that was pretty cool. And also. We got him in a trade down. We traded again from pick 42 to 50 and we got an extra third rounder. That's awesome. That's this. Is, they probably would have taken him at pick 42. Like, I think if the giants just stood pat at 42, you know, Lander Dickerson was off the board. Apparently they weren't interested in Landon Dickerson. That might be a little high, you know, you know, we weren't going to take him if he was there. Tevin Jenkins was off the board. You know, all the other, like, like if they would have taken an edge there, like I, but, you know, he probably would have been the guy. Like, I really do think he would have been the pick at 42. They trade back to 50, and we get another third round pick. Yeah, absolutely. So, are, are so, we, so who do you think we're going to draft with that third round pick next year? Oh, yeah, we're, we're slacking on our 2022 preview. Bobby, we ready to move on to, uh, to our third round pick? No. Because no? I'm, I, no, no, no. Yes, we are. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, <laughs> all right. This one was interesting. Now, the today's Tony makes a ton of sense. Aziz Ojolari comes in plays that outside linebacker Aaron Robinson is the most interesting pick in this draft to me he really is could like because we have Donnie Holmes now let's let's talk about Aaron Robinson as a player cornerback out of UCF five foot eleven 186 pounds at his pro day ran a four three nine forty remember these are pro day time so let's not get too crazy on them I also 37 ran like inch, a, I ran a four three two at my pro day so yes exactly 37 inch vertical jump now you can't fake a vertical jump so that's legit and a 4 through 9 20 yard shuttle, which isn't great. He's a slot corner. He played in the slot 75% of the uh, time at UCF, outside 50%. And he even had a, f- a few little box reps in there. Um, you know, he he he's only had one interception in the past two years. Transfer from Alabama. How about that? So we got we technically did get an Alabama player because Alan Aaron Robinson transferred from there. He 
is an aggressive press corner. He played press coverage 41% of the time at UCF. For a slot corner to be playing press coverage 41% of the time, that's a crazy high number. Like that, I, I don't think we realize how crazy that is. And like you said, the Giants, the areas want, they want to get better at, not necessarily positions, areas, this is one of those. Um, great burst to close in and wide receivers when he's in that off coverage. Good speed to play in the hip pocket. You know, like, you know, the, the 4 three, nine speed, you can kind of see that speed. Like, he, like, you don't have to worry about him getting burnt on a deep ball is essentially what I'm saying. Um, in fact, you know, there was a matchup against uh, Marquez Stevenson, who's a, he was a fifth rounder for the fifth or sixth rounder for the Bills down at the Senior Bowl from Houston. And two games lined up against Marquez Stevenson the last two years, Justin, three catches for 22 yards. I mean, lock this guy down. Now, Stevenson may not end up being a good NFL player, but he was someone that was drafted, uh, some of the you know better competition he went, and he just totally shut him down, make them look silly. And it, and it looked good, too. Like, the film really did back it up. Um, in zone, now, we're talking about him as a press, like, uh, man coverage, and this is something you mentioned to me, Justin, I agree with you. His zone coverage is, a like, he recognizes stuff very quickly, and he's got the hips to, like, flip and, and pick stuff up and to change, change directions. Um, uh, now where I would say he'll get in trouble is because he is an aggressive pl- corner. He'll get beat on double moves. That's where I, I worry about him is, is to beat on double moves or when he does open up his hips and is running deep on those like out routes, but that's more of playing on the, on the outside versus the slot. And I think that's why he played in the slot, you know, cause down at the senior bowl, they had him on the outside on Trevon Grimes. Some, and it was like, you know, he was winning on those outbreaking routes because he had his hips wide open, just going full speed, try to stop the deep ball. But he can stop the deep ball, and I do think he can play some outside corner if need be. In fact, I, I would trust Aaron Robinson on the outside more than I would Darnay Holmes. Um, and then lastly, he's really scrappy in the run game. He likes to fight through blocks. He, you know, A lot of corners and wide receivers, you'll, and this is some, people don't talk about this, sometimes they'll agree that, hey, I'll let, you know, let's take this play off. You know, I'll block you. You, know, you don't need to go and run a million miles per suit. Let's Deion take Sanders. this play off. We got to run a lot. We got to run rounds. We got to run with each other. They don't like, you know, have an agreement before the game, but it's just kind of like this wide receiver corner thing. And Robinson ain't that he fights through everything and he loves to come up and hit. Yeah. Along with like his aggressiveness and, um, you know, his, his, his want in the run game, he even has some, now I don't want to say he has safety experience, but he has in the box experience. So the giants love their versatility, you know, <laughs> because there's such a good problem in the secondary right now. And I don't think, you know, you're going to be cutting Darnay Holmes. You're not going to be cutting Aaron Robinson. You know, those guys are, they're going to have to coexist somehow. You know, why not have some reps of Darnay Holmes in the slot and Aaron Robinson in the box? Is that kind of like a wild thought? You know, if, if they really want to do that, you know, um, but Bobby, the, the, the couple terms, I'm not going to really, I, I agree with you as your break, you know, you're, your, your breakdown with him as a player, but here, here's just a sentence of how I kind of describe him aggressiveness, stickiness, awareness, ability to flip his hips and short area burst all work hand in hand together. All of those things together, I think make up like who Aaron Robinson is as a player. And it's because of how aware he is. And it's because he has that natural good short area burst that he's able to be a little sticky and he's able to play aggressive and he's able to flip his hips uh, pretty, pretty well. So um, awesome. Uh, you know, if you want some advanced stats, it's 20, he allowed 25 receptions on 47 targets in 2019 and 2020, 33 receptions on 56 targets in 2019, 296 yards, four touchdowns allowed in 2020, 484 slot snaps, uh, 100, 101 pass rating allowed in 2020, 63.8 pass rating allowed in 2019. Doesn't have a lot of interceptions. Uh, I, I don't know if you talked about that. Doesn't have a lot of the, no, just, the one. just uh, he doesn't have, you know, doesn't have a, what, what I'm trying to say, you know, he had another one, but it got called back because of a, a penalty that wasn't and in 2019. There. I think he had some, um, but doesn't have a lot of ball, like playing the ball experience. It's probably not the correct phrase, but I will say that that's like a critique that he doesn't have a lot of like playing the ball, you know, up in the air, or, you know, doesn't have a lot of ball skills. I don't think that's a fair critique because you saw some of the clips at the senior bowl where 
even when a ball is arriving at, you know, at the catch point for a wide receiver, he does a good job of sticking his hands in there, just trying to make contact, trying to lay a hit to force an incompletion. So maybe he's not going to have like a lot of pass deflections in the, like the basic stat box of like pro football reference, but maybe he's going to be a guy like on PFF that is going to recognize that he forces a lot of incompletions. Let's talk about him versus Darnay Holmes. That is interesting. Now I think Darnay Holmes is better. I do, but Aaron Robinson does some things better that the Giants want to be better at, and that's press man coverage. You know, and if they want, and if and if if you if you just had if if you had a six foot two wide receiver and he's going deep, I would much rather have Aaron Robinson than Darnay Holmes, and that's why Darnay Holmes had to move from the outside to the slot. You know, that was my worry. That was why last year around this time, I was like I was like Darnay Holmes has to move in the slot because when he's on the outside, he will get stacked. A wide receiver will stack him, and they will win those deep balls easily. Not because he can't keep up with them; he just can't handle the size. He's just not good at that. Um, so he's in; he's better in areas that the Giants want to be better at. But I would say Darnay Holmes is better. I really, as overall as a player, he would better, be better. But I really think this is the most interesting camp battle. Now, there is no there's every other camp battle we'll talk about is either like you know there's a rotation like like this is the one where I have no clue what's going to happen. Like, like, like who wins this battle? I, I, am, I am perplexed at, at how this ends up working. And like, do you think the Giants will get cute with it? And they, you know, they rotate them. But then it's like, you know, if they rotate them, then will that tip off the, you know, opposing offenses, what the Giants are trying to do? Like, I am, I can't wait to see yeah. how they use these guys. Like, you know, week one, we learn a lot about a team. Week one, I can't, if Robinson plays orig- uh, initially, it's going to be like, how do, how do they, work these two yeah and the the crazy thing is is that the giants traded up to get this guy they didn't just stay they didn't just stand pat and pick him you know wherever their wherever their selection was they traded up um you know a good amount of picks not like you know they didn't jump rounds they didn't dr- jump 20 picks but they they traded up to get this guy so this is a guy that they targeted this is a guy that they wanted this is a guy that's not coming out of one of those uh, stereotypical SEC schools which Joe Judge has uh, all of uh, all of uh, co- all of the coaches from the 2010s SEC <laughs> SEC schools on his coaching staff right now so they wanted this guy and they clearly have to have a plan um yeah bobby it is it is going to be fun but also corner is so tough to project and I would say that Dorney Holmes is better simply because he's been here for a year and he had success, right? Because corner is so tough to project because DeAndre Baker had, uh, had an awesome rookie camp. Awesome, awesome rookie camp. He didn't allow a completion. DeAndre Baker did not allow a completion during the 2019 training camp. He goes out there and he's one of the worst he corners in the National Football League. rob him either. Huh? Nothing. That was a dumb joke. It was a, you gave a dumb robbery joke, didn't you? Yeah. Yeah. Um. Tough to Here's something you mentioned. They traded up. They traded up the the fifth round pick they got from the Bears. I want to mention some players that went between that pick that they traded and the Giants' next pick. Dalen Hayes. I'm going to try like and make you. Guy. I'm going to try and make you sad. Cam McGrone. No, stop. Deontay Brown. Elijah Mitchell. No. Sean Davis, you don't know him, safety out of Florida. Actually, I didn't really like like Sean Davis was one of the safety I was going to talk about, and I wasn't a big fan, so I didn't. I didn't. We didn't talk about it in the episode. You just listed three guys that I previewed. I know. I'm trying to make you sad. No, I'm, I'm trying I'm to make ha- you. I'm, I'm trying to make you hate Aaron Robinson. No, don't do that. Do. You can't do that. Oh, look at this can't alarm. You know what that alarm is? You know what that alarm is? It maybe it's time for you to talk no, about. No, 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 no. I actually want. To, do you know what that alarm? Remember when we tried to do a newsletter? This is oh. that was my alarm to like do the newsletter on Sunday night, and I have never turned that alarm off, even though we don't do the newsletter anymore. Tough. We're gonna talk about Alex Smith though, Justin. This was a, ch- a shot by the Giants. Alex Smith, edge out of Northern Iowa, six foot five, two hundred sixty-two pounds. Now people are saying he's six foot seven as pro day, but at the Senior Bowl, he listed up at six foot five. Where they, it's not like they just use the roster; they measured him up. So. I think they kind of lied at his pro day about his height. I don't know how they added two inches to his height to his pro day. It's but not people, like the senior people are the getting senior, confused with Jordan Smith, who is who is six seven. But people are saying Ellerson Smith is six foot seven, though. They're confused. But but they're not because his pro day numbers say six foot seven. Hmm. But the senior bowl and the one the senior bowl is not like the senior bowl is like 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 they want to make these guys look better because you know the the better 
that the senior, like the better that the senior bowl players look or get drafted is the better for the senior bowl. They have him at six foot five, but he does have a 42 inch vertical jump. You can't fake that 26 bench press reps. Didn't play in 2020. Wasn't an opt out. Northern Iowa just didn't have a season. Um, in 2019, he had 63 tackles, 14 sacks, 21 and a half tackles for a loss. Production, production, production. In 2018, he had seven and a half sacks, 10 and a half tackles for a loss. A very long and tall player. When he came to college, how much did he weigh, Justin? He weighed, um, I want to say, 220-ish pounds. 195 pounds. Wrong. <laughs> so he's added 60-something pounds, but he's kept his athleticism. He was a really good athlete that can get lateral quick, and it really showed off of the senior bowl. And I do think the senior bowl mattered for this player more than it did any others. Um, decent hand use, uh, usage, but needs to add moves. Uh, good get off to test offensive tackles. Like his best players are where he just gets off the ball and he makes an offensive tackle look silly with his speed. Um, now he really needs to add strength. We talked about Aziz Ojolari needing some strength. It's Ellerson needs it on a different level of what, of what he's, uh, at strength. And that wouldn't make his pass rump pass rush a ton better, but unlike, uh, you know, Aziz Ojolari, his strength really shows up in the run game in a negative way. Like he can get just flat out bullied in the run game. Like if, if now, if he can stay, like he gets moved off the spot. Now he can disengage in the run game. Like he's good at that, but just playing the run, playing your gap, playing it strong. Ellerson Smith will not do that. He'll get bullied. And sometimes where it's just embarrassing and they'll like, they'll, I, I seen a tight end punk him. So that's, that's the worry about him. But what this is, is the Giants took a shot on some uh, a guy who has the frame, who can get better, who is a growing player, and they are taking a shot at some pass rush because he's not a scheme fit. He is simply a pass rusher. Funny how wrong I was in particular. Um, I, I want to say we, but I'm going to take the fall for this. It's funny how wrong we were. Uh, I, I was. I just said not we, and I said I was going to take the fall for it. It's funny how wrong I was. Um, when, when looking at, oh, the Giants are going to add an edge rusher, but they're only going to add, add an edge rusher, like a, like a Kuwiti pay, right? Who, in all actuality, Bobby, I'm, I'm saying this in hindsight now that we're, now that we're after the draft and we did take him. Kuwiti pay is a boring player. He's a boring player to talk about. I, now, I know, you know. You're a boring he, player. I am a boring player. Now, I know you like him more than most, and, you know, he, he is he is like kind of the number – he was like the number one consensus edge rusher in this draft Two. class, right? Number two, who was number one? He was my one, the consensus two after Phillips. Well, Jalen Phillips. Well, Jalen, you know, Jalen Phillips had all the health problems too. People forget. Um, but Kuwiti Pay, it would have been a little boring if you know if we got a player like him, right? Whereas what we did is especially Ellerson Smith. I think Ellerson Smith, I think is a little bit more exciting to talk about than Aziz Ojulari because there's a there's a little bit more unknown. He didn't play 2020. He showed up to the senior bowl like 30 pounds heavier than he was the previous year. I watched the entire North Dakota State game and then I I chopped up about 50, it was about 50 seconds worthy of highlight worthy plays from that North Dakota State game from 2020. What tackle did he go up against, Bobby? Dylan Radins. So he I went up against he got that drafted by, but he 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 was somebody, another senior bowl guy that at, Remember we asked Dalen Hayes and we asked, like I asked like a good amount of defenders. They said, who was the best guy he went up against? They all said Dylan Radins. There you go. So he went up against him in 2019. Um, and <laughs> just looking at him. So he wore, he wore number 16. He looked like a quarterback. Like if, if you put him next to Trey Lance and they were just standing next to each other, but like, yeah, those two guys are quarterbacks. Um, you know, partially it's the, it's the bias of the number where if uh, he wore like a number in the forties or the fifties, I'd be like, Oh yeah, you're a linebacker. Um, but yeah, he super small, but super athletic, super freaky uh, the football grump, good friend of the program, just giants podcast. He kind of compared him to like OC coming off the edge. And I can't do that because OC is like my favorite player growing up. I can't do that yet, but I would be lying if I wasn't watching some clips and some plays of him just screaming off the edge and be like, he's coming like a bat out of hell right now. And there's no tackle that's touching him. And it kind of does remind me of that, but I'm not there yet. I can't go there. No, I think the senior bowl made a huge impact because he did look better and something from his film. I was like, man, he needs to just like, he should try and work these guys inside sometimes. And he did that at the senior bowl. Um, and I think that would add to his pass rush. And he did, you know, seem to add some strength you know, when he was down there playing in the run drills, because 
if you just go off the film from 2019 and didn't get to play in 2020 because they didn't have a season, like I want to have pick, like, like I would have taken Chris Rump over him. I would have taken Rashad Weaver over him. I think both those guys are better pass rushers. Um, and I still like I still like those guys better than him. And it's you know the the argument against you know, Rashad Weaver is like, well, he's not a scheme fit. It's like, well, Ellerson Smith isn't necessarily a scheme fit. Like he never right. dropped back in the coverage. He's not good against the run. Chris Rumpf, it's like, well, you can drop Chris Rumpf back in the coverage. Now he's going to be bad versus the run, but so is Ellerson. So I would have taken, like, if you told me right now you can take one of those three players, I would have taken the other two. I, 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 and I still would, but I think the Senior Bowl really made an impact on them of like, okay, this guy's different. Now, yeah. so, you know, and, and that Senior Bowl mattered because if you look at the just the 2019 film, I think those two players are clearly better where the, the Senior Bowl shows an ascending player. And I think that's what it is, is this is a, this is, we need pass rush. We're taking a risk on a guy who can become a really awesome pass rusher where Chris Rumpf, I do think might be a little tapped out, even though I think he's good. Um, and Rashad Weaver is not the most athletic guy, even though he has really awesome pass rush moves. So I really yeah. do think, I think this move was a shot in the dark, like not a shot in the dark, but they were taking a chance. Like I don't listen, yeah. I don't expect Ellerson to come in and play a ton year one. No, no, not at all. Um, and it's kind of crazy that, you know, Z is, is 20 years old. Ellerson Smith didn't play in 2020, put on a lot of weight. So it's like, you know, who, somebody's going to have to play out of these edge rushers, right? And then there's question marks with Lorenzo Carter and O'Shane Zimenez with injury. And there's just question marks around O'Shane Zimenez and how much the Giants even like him in the first place. Because even when he was healthy, he was only playing sometimes 30 to 40 to 50, you know, 30 to 40 percent of the snaps. Um, I don't know if you talked about. Uh, the one of my favorite things about Ellerson is just his rip and swim combo. Um, rip and it's just, swim, I love it. It's beautiful. His smooth, swim move is beautiful. It doesn't. It almost. It almost doesn't even look like over how fast he is getting the lineman's hands off of him. It doesn't even look like anybody's touching him at times. It almost just looks like you know he's just doing it with like a random pole that's like in the middle of beautiful. the street, and he's just doing it like for fun. I'm like, dude, you have like a 300 pound man, like trying to put his hands on you. And it doesn't even look like you're doing it with anybody trying to even stop you. So that's, that's also one of the things that I, uh, that I like to be, yeah, he was a problem. It, it, that North Dakota state game b- bad. Like it was pitiful in the run game. Like they were targeting his side over and over and over yeah. again, and they were doing well. Um, but the upside is there, Bobby Skinner. Yeah. Yeah. He's got the length that a lot of guys that, you know, that I like don't have. Um, so he needs to add some weight, Justin, but you know, who doesn't me. I don't need that anyway. I need I need to lose weight, and I'm trying to eat better. But healthy breakfast doesn't have to be boring. Like like I, I'm trying to eat healthy uh, healthy, but it's like you know I like a, I like a nice hearty breakfast. But it you know it doesn't have to be boring. You can have a good like tasty breakfast and also have it be healthy. Magic Spoon has the amazing flavors you love. Magic Spoon is cereal, Justin. Did you know that? I did. It's healthy cereal though. Cereal usually is not healthy. Like it's junk. Like, you know, like growing up, cereal was one of the best parts of being a kid. But I had to give it up because I realized it was full of sugar and junk that you sh- you really shouldn't eat that stuff, you know? Oh, I right? know. Stop eating that junk, that crap cereal. That's what I want to say. Well, guess what? You don't have to with Magic Spoon. Magic Spoon has zero grams of sugar, 13 to 14 grams of protein, and only four net grams of carbs in each serving. Only 140 calories a serving. That's unreal. It's keto friendly, gluten free, grain free, soy free, low carb, low carb. I, I I was in the soy soy soy. I said I said loy. low low carb oh. and GMO free. They got a variety pack. Four flavors are cocoa, fruity, frosted, and peanut butter. Peanut butter is my favorite. Justin, what about you? Well, I'm allergic to peanut butter. Um, so sucks to be me. Uh, I saw some fruity. I saw some like uh, f- fruity flavored, and I am excited for that. Well, and and I I like cocoa. Like you know, I'm I used to live in cocoa. Javian Hawkins, who the Giants should have drafted instead of uh, Brightwell, is from cocoa. But you could I can mix the cocoa with the peanut butter, and it's like a peanut butter cup. Uh, it tastes exactly like regular cereal from your childhood, but it's super nutritious. It's delicious, but super healthy cereal that really brings joy to your mornings or afternoons. I we're not going to judge if you eat cereal in the afternoon. Go to magicspoon.com slash giants to grab a variety pack and try it today. And be sure to use our promo code giants at checkout to save $5 off your order. And Magic Spoon is so confident in their product, it's backed with 100% happiness guarantee. So if you don't like it for any reason, they'll refund your money. No questions asked. 
Like, we can't refund your money for talking Giants, but they can do that. Remember, get your next delicious bowl of guilt-free cereal at magicspoon.com slash Giants and use promo co- and use the code Giants to save $5 off. Thank you, Magic Spoon, for sponsoring this episode. Justin, the Giants got a running back. Now we're, now we're in the sixth round. Six round players, Justin, are they supposed to come in and be impact players? Are they guarantees to even make the roster? Are they guarantees to even, you know, play in the NFL ever? No. No. So so keep that in mind when we're talking about these next two guys. Gary Brightwell, running back out of Arizona, six foot one, two hundred eighteen pounds. That's one a big boy. He's a big boy, Gary Brightwell is, Justin. Um, never got a lot of carries, though. The most carries he got in the season was 91, which was in 2018 where he averaged 5.8 yards per carry. Um, and then in 2019, he was J.J. Taylor's backup, or, you know, a guy that we both like. Mm-hmm. Um, I like way more than you, though. Nope, false. Uh, 66 carries, 390 yards, and five touchdowns that year, 5.9 yards per carry. And then in 2020, as the lead back, they only played five games. So he had 88 carries, 290 yards, one touchdown, 4.4 yards per catch. Justin, he's a big player who plays big. Like, it's, he's, he's big, and he plays with that size. Now, some people, like, you know, some of the scouting reports said, like, his vision is great. I like his vision. I really do. When he has a chance to use his vision, it shows up, and he finds the lane, and he does it quickly. Now, Arizona kind of sucks, so sometimes it's like, well, we're going to find a cutback. It's like, yeah, he had three freaking defenders in his lap because Arizona just sucked. Um, nice juke and jump cut. Uh, like, he has that nice stutter step, and it's effective. He kind of reminds me of, of Dev- uh, Devontae Freeman, to be honest. Like I, And then I saw people uh, comparing him to that in my mentions. I was like, ooh, that makes me feel good because I, I said that, so people agree with me. Um, his cuts are very quick. Decent athlete. He's not fast, but he's not slow. Um, here's the thing, Justin, and here's why I don't like this pick. He's he's a decent runner, but he doesn't do anything special as a runner. Yeah. Like he's a good runner. If we're just talking about him as a runner, I'm fine. I'm fine with it. You know, and it's like again, it's a six round pick, but he kind of sucks at everything else. Like for someone that that's big, he is a horrible blocker. Not just and it's mental, it's mental lapses and physically. Like he is a like he is an atrocious blocker for someone that that size. It just doesn't make sense. He doesn't really add much in the receiving game. He's had drops and he came into Arizona as a receiver, which. You know, it just doesn't make sense. And he has a ton of – he has fumbles. You know, there was one game where he had three fumbles in, in just that one game. Yeah. Um. So, like, that's what kind of I, – I don't like this pick. Now, here's what will be said. Special teams. He is more than just – you know, he's not just like a, a return. Like, he has – like, he has tackles. Like, he's done, like, done it all on special teams. Now, I haven't watched it. I don't watch special teams film, and you can't really – you can't find it on these guys anyways unless you just watch full game clips. And also, we don't want to watch special teams film. No, I would never want to watch special teams. <laughs> um, So, I'll be honest, Justin. I'm not – you know, I'm not a huge fan of this pick because this guy has a fast track to be running back three. Like right now we have Saquon, Devontae Booker. They signed a couple futures deals, but this guy had a draft pick invested in him. He has the fast track to be running back three. And even with that, like there was guys taken behind him or not even taken at all that we would have been thrilled with Puka Williams and, and, you know, Javon Hawkins, both guys, you know, those were our guys. Those guys didn't even get drafted. Demetric Felton. He could have added you, you know, he played running back in college. So he has some receiving ability. Like he's an exciting player. Khalil Herbert, who everybody loved, you know, he was taken after. I, if there was one pick, you told me like, I don't like it. It's this one because he just, he's a good runner, but he sucks at everything else. And I feel bad saying that, but like, he's, he's a bad, bad blocker. And he doesn't really add anything as a receiver unless it's like, a, you know, a dump off. And if you look at his measurables in terms of percentiles compared to halfbacks in terms of his height, weight, 40 yard dash, you know, some pro day combine underwear, Olympic stuff. Um, <laughs> there is nothing that is like impressive. There's nothing that sticks out like, wow, you know, he's, he's kind of bad everywhere else, but you know, he's pretty fast or you no, know, maybe, you know, his broad, he's got a broad jump, three cone drill, whatever. Um, no, he, he's not. And you know, I, I, you will not hear me complain about, you know, if, if there is one pick that is not exciting for the giants, if you're going to, you know, if you're going to ask me, what, what round do you prefer? The giants not have an exciting draft pick. Yeah. I would say it's their two six round picks. You know, yeah. Bobby, it, what it comes down to is, and I think we just have to accept this because we, this has been two years in a row 
where we have wished and we have wanted the Giants to do something interesting with their backup running back spot. Now, Devontae Booker's fine. You, know, you overpay for your running back too. And, you know, he is better than Wayne Gallman. Sure, fine. We'll accept it, right? Um, but if we want them to do something fun and creative with running back three, they're not. They're, they're not. And uh, I, why I think they, you know, maybe they like Gary Brightwell and probably even more than uh, Alfred Morris and Wayne Gallman is that Wayne Gallman and Alfred Morris provided zero, nada, nothing on special teams. And that's basically the difference here. Brightwell provides that. Yeah. I mean, he's like, he's a big guy and like, I like his running, you know, it's not like electric, but I like, I like him as a runner, but man, it's, you know what, like we're one injury away from him taking six, having six carries a game and being in on critical downs, you know, like that's Alfred Morse. When he played, he averaged six carries a game. It was in on downs and you know, we're, you know, it, it was in 2019 where John Hillman had the starter game because the giants didn't take their fourth running back serious. You know, let alone, you know, let alone just their, you know, Hillman was their third running back. Like they didn't take, they didn't take their third running back serious with John Hillman. And he's, he was the worst starting running back the Giants have ever had in my entire lifetime because they didn't take that running back three spot. And I'm not saying they're not taking it serious, but it's like, I think he should be taken more serious as just a running back more than a yeah. special teams player. Yeah. I, I can't help. I, like if they I get an undrafted disagree. free agent running back, I'll probably like that guy more than, than him. Yeah. Without a doubt. Um, the biggest flaw and concern for me is that he is a big fan of Tiki Barber. Like that, that is a big, and he fumbles. Big what about that? And he fumbles. I mean, just bad, 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 uh, bad duo right there. Um, so look at us. Look at, look at negative Bobby and Justin. Just, I feel bad because he seems like an awesome dude. Like his story is awesome. We had Zach Rosenblatt on the stream. Like he's, he's an awesome. I'm, I mean, I, he's, he's in blue. So I'm obviously rooting for him. I'm just rooting him in, rooting for him in general. But I just, uh, you know, if we already had our third running back on the roster, I, it would be like, okay, that, you know, they want him to play special teams and if he can develop as a runner, but it's just like, he has the fast check to be our, our third running back yeah. uh, week one. So, all right, Justin, let's close out the 2021 New York Giants NFL draft with Rodarius Williams, cornerback out of Oklahoma state, six foot, 189 pounds. Justin, this is somebody you previewed in our, our DB preview episode. Yeah. And, you know, we previewed a lot of players this, this uh, year, but I think being previewed in that episode means something because that's the one episode we split. We split it we, between cornerbacks and safety. So you only did three cornerbacks. No, he I, was did, one um, of, I did four cornerbacks. Oh, well, now you just made it cheaper. Now we maybe Rodarius Williams isn't a good pick. No, I, I do like this pick out of Rod, Rodarius Williams. Um, uh, you know, I'll let you read the advanced stats, but he's an expert in stopping the big play. Like on, on deep passes, the, the opposing team was two for eight. Um, I think he's scheme versatile. He's, a, he's another press man corner. He has a lot of experience yep. playing press man coverage. Um, and you can put him in that cover, you know, that cover three scheme that the Giants ran last year, which stops the big play. But you can also put him in a cover two. You can put him in man coverage. And I really do think that's why they took him. As he is a, vers- a scheme versatile corner. He's not, you know, one way or the other, where J.C. Horn is just this press man corner, and this this corner is a, a cover three corner. Um, can mirror with, with releases. You know, he's not going to get beat on double moves. Like, he refuses to get beat on double moves. Um, great at swatting balls, playing through the hands. Didn't give a, a single touchdown this past season. Again, I'll, I'll let you read the advanced stats. And and he's big, too. Six foot one, tall corner. Yeah, he's not, he's the thing, not though, subject. Justin. Huh? He's twenty five. He's going to be twenty five when the season starts. He's an old man. Yeah, he's an old old man. It's crazy that you know he's drafted two years after his brother Greedy Williams, but he is a couple years older. Um, yeah. So, uh, Rotarius Williams, cornerback from Oklahoma State. Um, he was the last cornerback that I previewed on my on our cornerback episode. So it wasn't it wasn't like oh this guy was like my second guy and I, and I was most enticed by him. I kind of put him last and um, I put him last for a reason. Partially, I did put him i just included him on my list because he was grady williams's older brother but i'm glad we took it i'm glad i'm glad i previewed him but I, was too- I had him as an early fifth round pick oh you, you know? did like I, I i like this pick you know like it's yeah now again we have a ton of dbs so you know like he may not even make the roster but i like i like rodarius williams we have 13 cornerbacks pick. on the roster right now do you want to know how many ro- do you want to know how many cornerbacks made 
the, yeah, but the you know feet. what Sam Beal and Chris Milton and all those other weirdos from Tennessee they don't count to me. No, well, well, Sam, well, Sam Beal opted. Well, I'm I'm just saying how many cornerbacks made the initial 53 man roster in 2020? Corners you know? or DBs? Corners. In 2021, in 2020. Yeah, how many made the initial 53 man roster? I texted you this, so you should already know. So th- this is further evidence that you don't listen to me. No, I thought I thought it was I I saw it. so they had James Bradbury. Darnay Holmes, Corey Ballantyne, Ryan Lewis, Isaac Yudem. Initial 53-man roster, not not throughout the season. I'm, I'm thinking week one. They had four. They had four cornerbacks. Corey Ballantyne, Isaac Yudem. Oh, Ryan Lewis wasn't on it. Ryan Lewis was a waiver claim. But that counts yes. as the initial. <laughs> um, okay, 10 for 21. 10 receptions, 21 targets, Rodarius Williams in 2020. Elite 30, advanced numbers. 36 for 64 in 2019. When targeted over 20-plus yards in 2020, like Bobby said, he kind of prevents the big explosive play. Two catches on eight targets. That's pretty good. Four forced incompletions, 653 press coverage snaps in his career. He's the older brother of Greedy Williams. He's 25 years old. Did not miss a single tackle in 2020. Find that to be fun, too. You know, that's I'm sure that's a guy that, you know, the Joe Judge values guys that are that, that are pretty good tacklers and a willing uh, a, a guy that's willing to get his nose in there in the run game. Um, does he not fight like he doesn't miss tackles, but like he is very focused on his receiver. Yeah. And that's how he stops the big plays. Like he never like peeks into like they run the ball to my side. He's just like, I've locked on my receiver. I don't care if they're running the ball. I will stop you from ever having a big play on me. Yeah. And he doesn't bite off a double moves off the line of scrimmage. He'll let you dance all day long. He's he'll stay patient. So, I mean, that doesn't surprise to hear me that, you know, that doesn't su- surprise me to hear that he's always locked in on his wide receiver. He'll stay patient. He's not going to overextend and he's not going to get beat off the line of scrimmage. So, um, cool. I know people That's- hated this pick because it's another DB, but I, I like this pick. You know, yeah. it's best player round round six. You are just, you are tight. You are taking players, not positions. You take yep. the guy that you think has the best chance to be a good NFL player. And, and I think Rodarius has a chance at that. Um, so, so I, I am actually, you know what? I'm not excited, but I do like the pick. I'm not excited yeah. about Rodarius, but I do like the pick. Um, so he's, who's, you think he's going to start over at Dory Jackson? There's chance he's got, he, he, he may be older. He's not, he's a, yeah, he actually might be, let's see who's <laughs> old, who's older, a Dory Jackson or let's see, let's figure this out. A Dory Jackson. And I think a Dory Jackson is young. So a Dory Jackson's 25. His birthday is September 18th. This is going to be, oh no, he is older because. Radarius is 24 right now. He's turning 25 in September. So he's a year. Adora Jackson is a year older. Okay. Freaking old ass Adora Jackson. Why do we even sign that guy? So freaking old. Sheesh. Um, all right. That's a, that's a draft. Now we'll be back on Friday or Thursday with our undrafted free agents. It's looking like it's just going to be one episode. Usually we split between offense and defense, but the giants, um, the Giants didn't. They're not. They're not uh, aggressive in the undrafted free agent market. They signed so many futures deals, and so you know. You want to know my last bullet point is, Justin, for this episode. Thank you. An emotional thing. I'm emotional. Like I love this time of year. We put so much work into it that like I I get like a very sentimental. Like I enjoy this. Like I remember the moments from this. Um, I had a lot of fun this draft season. We we streamed for over 15 hours. We had a lot of fun. We had, you know, different people talk with you. You know, we, we gained, like, this is our biggest, our second biggest time of, of growth the year. You know, yep. the start of the season is our biggest part of growth. And this is our second biggest. And I don't think it's that big of a difference to be honest. Like this is a biggest part of growth. Um, and I, I really do love doing it. And you know what, as much work as we did, I am going to watch every, I'm going to watch double the players next year. I'm going to start like next week. You know, I'm going to take this week, you know, like undrafted free agents. I'll probably take one week off and then I'm starting. I am starting on my draft coach for next year because I want to know every single player. I don't want anybody to ask me, oh, do you know about this player? And me say no. I, I, I love doing this stuff. It's so much fun. Um, and I can't, I can't wait to do it next year. Um, and here's something I will say. Because you know what, Justin? We got a lot of people who are listening to this episode. They're not going to listen to – they're not going to listen until week one. Like, you know, we know how it is. You know, it's, it's a team-centered podcast. A lot of people aren't going to listen to us until week one. Here's my pitch to you. We have a lot of fun. We don't mail it in this time of year. We do two episodes a week no matter what. 
and we do different things. A lot of shows at this time of year, it's like, oh, let's just do a mailbag once a week. We'll answer questions. We'll talk about the same things over and over again. We'll talk about Daniel Jones needs to make a leap forward. Like this, this, a lot of shows talk about the same things over and over again. We hit different topics every single episode. Now we'll have a couple of mailbags thrown in there, but we hit different topics. You know, we do one week where we do preview next year's draft. Um, you know, our 4th of July, you know, our 4th of July episode, I, I look forward to every year where it's like, we don't even talk about the giants on that episode. We just have fun. Um, so we're going to be hit. We're going to, if you listen to this podcast between now and this and the start of camp, I guarantee you, you'll be the smartest giants fan, you know, because we, we really do put just as much effort into this part of the off season than we well, actually not. That's not true, but we put it, we, we really, I love this show. This show is my life. I love this show. And that doesn't go away these next couple months. Thank you. Thank you for your support. Um, you know, we, we celebrated on Friday, 10,000 subscribers on YouTube. And now we're already past uh, 10.5K in a matter of just uh, just two, two more days after that. Um, so, you know, that's kind of cool. Um, we just crossed, we're, we're getting closer to 1,000 ratings on the Apple Podcast app. We just crossed 700. So it's kind of, I mean, your, your sport means everything. But also, Bobby, more than anything, I'm ready to win some goddamn football games this year. More than anything, I'm ready to get back into MetLife Stadium. I'm ready to get back screaming on, on third down. I'm ready to get back at my all 22 coaches angle, watching the game, seeing plays develop. Daniel Jones hit Kenny Galladay over the middle of the field for some big touchdowns. I'm ready for it. I'm just envisioning in my head right now with my eyes closed. All right. So we may see you on Thursday and we say we, we may see you week one, but until then let's go big blue. <laughs>